Hi everybody, my name is Curtis Mitch and I'm with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. And welcome back to another one of our weekday reflections on the daily mass readings. Today is a beautiful Monday, October 19th. And the gospel reading for today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. But I'm gonna mix it up a little bit. Instead of focusing on the gospel, I'd like to focus on the first reading, which comes from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter two, verses one through 10. Now, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians has a special place in my heart. It is one of, uh, one of my favorite Pauline epistles. It is just, it's a thing of polished beauty. It captures the distilled essence of the Christian message in a unique way, even though it's just a short letter. But it's so beautiful and it's so encouraging. Now, Ephesians is typically classified as one of Paul's captivity epistles. It means that he's incarcerated as he's writing the letter. Now we know that from the letter itself. In Ephesians 3.1, Paul refers to himself as a prisoner for Christ Jesus. He does the same thing in chapter 4 verse 1. And then later at the end of the letter, when he's, when he's closing it out, he refers to himself as an ambassador in chains. All right, for the Lord Jesus. So Paul is imprisoned at the time that he's writing. And Paul was imprisoned and incarcerated and thrown into dungeons and, and suffered greatly throughout his life. So that doesn't necessarily help us narrow things down, except that uh, most scholars are, are agreed, at least those who adopt a traditional line of interpretation, agreed that St. Paul was writing during the first Roman imprisonment. This is the time that he spent under house arrest in the city of Rome between the years 60 and 62. If you want to get the backstory to that, you read the very last chapter of the book of Acts. Acts 28 tells us how Paul, who had been arrested in Jerusalem and detained in the city of Caesarea, appealed his case to Caesar. And so he was taken all the way to the city of Rome. He had to rent uh, a living quarters in Rome at his own expense, and he was there chained to a Roman soldier for about two years as he was waiting to bring his case before the Caesar, who at this time in history was Caesar Nero. So this is Paul. He's under house arrest. He's chained to a Roman soldier, and he's writing to Christians his letter to the Ephesians. Now, this letter is written to young Christians, it would appear. In other words, we're talking about an audience that consists mainly of the newly baptized, okay? These are people who have only recently come to faith in Jesus and people who have only recently been incorporated into the church's sacramental life, beginning with the sacrament of baptism. And these young Christians may well be in the, the city of Ephesus in Asia Minor. That corresponds to, to the land of Turkey today. But there's some question, there's a question mark beside whether or not it's only written to the Ephesians because in some manuscripts, uh, the reference to Ephesus actually doesn't appear. And so there are scholars who think that maybe this was a circular letter that was passed around to various churches in Asia Minor. In any case, it would be around the area of Ephesus all the same. But because Paul is writing to young Christians, to those who are recently baptized, we might compare what he's doing in Ephesians to what we find in the early Christian church, something that is known as mystagogical catechesis. Mystagogical catechesis is post-baptismal catechesis. When young believers were formed in their faith by the bishops of the early church, you know, the, leading their way up to baptism, once they were baptized, their, their Christian instruction did not cease. It actually continued and it deepened. And so mystagogical catechesis was catechesis that was conducted so that the earliest Christians who were now participating in the mysteries through the sacraments who were now part and full members of the church would now be led deeper into the mysteries of salvation, deeper into the mysteries of salvation history, and deeper in particular into the workings of God in the sacraments. So that's sort of what Paul is doing here. He wants these young believers in Ephesus to gain a full appreciation for the blessings that we've been given in Christ. 
He wants them to marvel at the gift of salvation we've received, and he wants them to marvel in the God who bestowed that so generously upon us. So let's read the passage, and then we'll try to isolate a few things and draw out some of the message for us today. This is Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 1. And you, Paul says, he made alive when you were dead through your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among these, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind. And so we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, and this is the transition to verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what is going on in this passage? This passage is clearly all about the subject of salvation. Salvation in Jesus Christ. A salvation that these young believers in Ephesus have just recently received. And when Paul is talking about salvation, he he defines it in a couple of different ways. Paul tells us in this passage what we are saved from. He tells us what we are saved by. And he tells us what we are saved for. So that's the way we're going to proceed. We're going to sort of see what Paul is getting at here. What is salvation from? What is it by? And what is it for? So first, what are we saved from? Paul, the first thing he says is that we're saved from death. He says, you were dead through your trespasses and sins. Now, what is Paul talking about? He's not talking about biological death or bodily death or physical death or death in this world, all right, people who still have a pulse are dead in their trespasses and sins to the extent that they're separated from God, to the extent they have not yet received the salvation that comes in Christ. And so Paul is saying that their union with God, their right relationship with God is already dead, all right, when they're living in sin. Okay, and incidentally, just as a side note, this is where we get the notion of mortal sin, sin that leads to spiritual death, not physical death, but spiritual death, a death of that right relationship that we're supposed to have with God. And more precisely, the church teaches us that spiritual death means that our souls have been emptied of the grace of God. Our souls no longer have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within them. And so our souls are like corpses. And like corpses, corpses have no power to bring themselves back to life. So likewise, those in a state of spiritual death, those who are unredeemed and and as of yet unsaved, have no power to bring themselves to salvation. This is something that God must do for us. And that's what Paul says that God has done. He has saved us from death because he has made us alive together with Christ. All right? So it's the life of God restored to the human person through faith, through grace, and through baptism that makes us alive. And Paul is saying, in a sense, that that, that God has tapped into the power of Christ's resurrection, and he is reproducing that resurrection in our own life, okay? The resurrection of Christ is reproduced in us in two stages. First, God raises our souls to life, 
That's what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 2. And then later, eventually, on the last day, he will raise up our bodies in Christ so that both body and soul will be resurrected with Jesus forever. So the first thing we're saved from is death by God making us alive in Christ. The second thing that we are saved from, Paul says, after death, he refers to the devil. All right. He mentions him in verse 2. He says that you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. All right, We have to remember that the universe is full of spirits that we can't even see. All right, And the head among them, the arch enemy who is opposed to God is Satan or the devil, whom Paul calls the prince, the prince of the power of the air. Now, in Jesus Christ, when we are baptized, we are rescued from the dominion of the devil, from his domination over our lives, his claim over us and his domination over our lives. Now, as Christians, we still face dangers because we are not rescued from the influence of of the devil over our lives, right? He can still tempt us. He can still lead us astray and lead us into sin. But in fact, we've been rescued from his dominion, okay? Ancient Christianity often read the whole Exodus story in the Old Testament as as Pharaoh representing the devil, that God was rescuing his people from the slavery to this other power, this other potentate, the Pharaoh of Egypt, and bringing the people out so that they would be free to serve God in a new way. And that's what's going on here. We've been freed from the devil's tyranny and his dominion over our lives. That's part of salvation too. The third thing, what do we save from? We are saved from death. We are saved from the devil. And Paul also says we are saved from the desires of mind and body. Okay? He says this in verse 3. He says, among these, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Our flesh is our fallen nature, following the desires of body of mind. Well, what are the desires of body and mind? Is that a bad thing to follow them? Well, what Paul is talking about here, when he's he's talking about what it's like to live in the flesh, apart from the grace of God and apart from the empowering spirit of God, when we live by the flesh, we live by the desires of body and mind, we are living according to the unconquerable selfishness that we find within ourselves, okay? Our inborn stubbornness, our inborn tendency to want things, to do things, and to not care about other people, all right? It's the thing we're we're born in an unredeemed state. We're collapsed in on ourselves, and so we find it very difficult, and we don't want to give ourselves to God or give ourselves to others or make sacrifices and those kinds of things. We are intrinsically selfish beings apart from the grace of God. And Paul is saying that once we've been given that grace, once we've been baptized and transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, that at point of fact, at that point, God gives us the power, this new ability to live for other people and not just for ourselves. So what do we say from? We're saved from death, we're saved from the devil, and we're saved from the from the desires of body and mind, the selfish and stubborn ones in particular. Now, next question. Paul addresses what are we saved by? Well, Paul tells us in verse 7, but then more clearly in verse 8, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Okay, so what is Paul saying? Well, first thing to notice here is that both grace And faith, the very ability to believe in Christ and to accept his gospel, is itself a gift of God. Okay, this isn't something that we muster up within ourselves. All we have to do, if we just give God this little bit, we believe what he reveals and then he gives us a whole avalanche of blessings in return. No, even faith itself is a gift that God gives us so that when we exercise faith, that's already a manifestation of God's grace working in our life. Because Paul says, for example, in Ephesians, that it has been granted to you to believe. 
This isn't just a little paltry contribution that you make on your part. Of course, you have to accept the grace to believe, but the grace to believe is a gift from God. The second thing, though, is we're saved by grace. And the question is, what is grace? That's really important. We need to understand that. If you ask, you know, eight out of 10 Christians, if you ask them, well, what is grace? You often hear answers like, it's God's unmerited favor. It's his undeserved gift by making you right with God. It's the thing that, 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 that applies Christ's righteousness to you and makes you right with God. Well, it is true as far as it goes that grace is an unmerited gift. It is something that we don't deserve, but God gives it to us freely and graciously anyway. But that doesn't tell us what the gift is. That tells us the conditions under which that gift is given. It's unmerited, undeserved. You didn't do anything to earn it. That's true as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough because it doesn't tell us what the gift is. When Paul talks about grace, this whole context of Ephesians 2 is telling us that the grace in question is the life of God that is poured into us. All right? The grace we receive is the grace of Christ's resurrection to be raised to new life. Okay? That's what grace is. It's our participation in the life of God. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our souls. Right? Grace is restored to our, school, our souls when God lives there again. Our souls are designed to be receptacles of the living God so that we would be temples. And that grace for us doesn't just change our status with God or change the way that God looks at us. That grace is transformative, right? It affects real change in us and in our souls. So that's what we're saved by. We're saved by grace through faith. The final question is, well, what are we saved for? Paul gets at that at the end of our passage in verse 8 and then verse 9 in particular. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of your own, your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not because of works, lest any man should boast. And then verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand. So that's what we are saved for. We are saved for good works. We are saved so that we can glorify God with our lives through the performance of good works. And what are these good works that Paul has in mind? Well, if you read his letters, there's a whole bunch of things that would fall under the category of good works. We're talking about works of righteousness, works of charity, works of generosity, works of humility and service, and, and no less importantly, works of obedience. Okay, apart from the grace of God, we cannot obey the law of God comprehensively. We can't obey it consistently. That's why we need grace to overcome that inborn stubbornness that we were talking about, the thing that prevents us from obeying even our almighty Lord. So what do we say for? We're saved for good works, but that grace that we talked about is the necessary prelude, the necessary precondition, all right? Because when God pours himself into the soul once again, making it alive once again, it is filled with his presence, but it is also filled with his power. We are strengthened on the inside to do what God is asking us to do. What we are too weak to do by our own natural abilities. Apart from grace, we don't have the strength. So God has to supply that strength, that supernatural ability to do the works that he wants us to do, the works that overcome selfishness and stubbornness. So God's grace then equips us. There's a direct connection between what we are saved by and what we are saved for. What we are saved by is grace. What we are saved for is good works that are only possible through the grace of God. Because that grace equips us to live for God and live for other people and not just live for ourselves. That grace equips us to overpower our selfishness so that we can live in a way that glorifies God. That 
is the glorious message of salvation that St. Paul is teaching in today's first reading. It is a salvation that saves us from death, from the devil, and from the desires, the selfish desires of body and mind. It is a grace that it saves us by, it is a salvation that is given to us by grace through faith, both of which are God's gifts to us. They're not our little contribution. And it's a salvation that saves us for something in particular so that we can glorify God through the performance of good works. I hope some of this has been helpful to you today. I hope you get a chance to kind of reflect on some of this and think about the many and mighty blessings that God has given us as Christians. I pray that God blesses you, your family, and your day. And I look forward to seeing you here again next time. Thanks.